Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Now recently you may have heard some people claiming that there is DNA in vaccines. OMG. Well I'm here to tell you that the claim is true. Double OMG. In fact some vaccines like the Chickenpox vaccine, for instance, are absolutely loaded with DNA. That's because chickenpox is a disease caused by a DNA virus and the vaccine uses an attenuated virus. OMG! And it's not just vaccines based on DNA viruses that are loaded with DNA either. Vaccines protecting against bacterial diseases are too because all bacteria contains DNA. OMG! And there are even vaccines known as DNA vaccines, which are based on DNA plasmids. OMG! And it's not just vaccines. DNA also enters our bodies when we are infected by bacteria and DNA viruses, or if we inhale pollen. It's even in the food we eat. OMG! What's that, Cindy? That's not the DNA we should be OMGing about. It's fine things contain lots of DNA. Our cells have various mechanisms to ensure that it isn't a problem. More on that later. What we should be OMGing about is that pretty much all vaccines contain trace amounts of DNA. And it's not just vaccines. Other biological products like insulin also contain trace amounts of DNA. And the reason for this is because they are grown in cells and cells contain DNA. Most of the DNA will be removed during the purification process, but trace amounts will remain. Of course, in all cases, it's not intact DNA, it's just fragments and the levels are several orders of magnitude below the safe level. OMG! What's that, Cindy? We're not OMGing about that either. We're OMGing because they also found trace amounts of DNA in the mRNA vaccines. OMG. Hang on. Wouldn't we expect to find it? Oh, I see. Anti-vaxxers don't know that, so they are making a big deal about it. Now I get it. OMG. So all this nonsense seems to have started with a guy called Kevin McKernan, who just so happens to have blocked me on the platform formerly known as Twitter. If you think it was because I was giving him a hard time about his nonsense, it's not. I've never had any interactions with him and have never mentioned him in a video before now. Mr. McKernan has an undergraduate degree in biology and is the founder of Medicinal Genomics, a company that markets test kits and genomics related activities to the cannabis, hemp and mushroom industries. Now, Mr. McKernan has managed to get hold of a number of out-of-date vials of both Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines and has analysed them and published the results. Most recently, he collaborated with some other people and published the following preprint. DNA fragments detected in monovalent and bivalent Pfizer slash BioNTech and Moderna mod RNA COVID-19 vaccines from Ontario, Canada. Exploratory dose response relationship with serious adverse events. What a mouthful. Anyway, for those who don't know, a preprint means it hasn't been peer-reviewed, which is kind of obvious when you look at the paper. So anyway, this is what they found. The levels of DNA are way below regulatory limits. And just in case you haven't noticed, they have plotted the data using a log scale, which makes the values seem much closer to the limit than they actually are. 
They have also plotted the number of adverse events for each lot number underneath, which seems to show that there is no relationship between adverse events and the amount of trace DNA, which is not remotely surprising. Although, even if the graph showed there was a relationship between the bears reports and the level of DNA, it would be irrelevant because Matt Timberlake checked the numbers for two of the lots on the bears database and the numbers in the paper are wrong. Anyway, they also confirmed in the paper that the DNA is not intact and has been broken down into small pieces, which is exactly as it should be. So what's an anti-vaxxer to do? Easy. Come up with a different method of quantifying DNA that gives a different answer and claim without any evidence that this method is correct and the other method isn't. So instead of the gold standard qPCR, which is the method they used that confirmed the levels were below the regulatory requirements, they used a method known as qubit fluorometry, which is a technique that uses fluorescent dyes that preferentially bind to the substance that you are interested in, in this case, DNA. The fluorescence is measured, which then gives you an estimate of the amount of DNA. It's not as accurate as qPCR, but in most cases it gives you a reasonable ballpark estimate in most cases. More on that later. Anyway, this is what they found. The qubit results suggested there were bucket loads more DNA than what the qPCR results did. O-M-G. Yes, Cindy, I know the results are wrong. I am saying O-M-G because I can't believe that the authors of the paper didn't realise they were wrong. As I previously mentioned, qubit gives reasonable estimates of DNA in most cases. But one of the cases where it doesn't is if there is also RNA present. This isn't too much of a problem if the amount of RNA isn't more than the amount of DNA in the sample. If you look at this graph here, the green circles in the image show the fluorescence readings for DNA, which is what is supposed to be being measured, whereas the red triangles show the readings for the same amount of RNA, which isn't supposed to be being measured. And the blue squares show the readings if they are both in the same sample. However, in the case of mRNA vaccines, there is heaps more RNA than DNA in the samples, at least 300 times more for the Pfizer vaccine and at least 500 to 1,000 times more for the Moderna vaccine. So the high numbers that were found by McKernan and co. in the qubit assay are just RNA interfering with the assay. If DNA levels are tested correctly, all batches have levels below the allowable limit. We know this because all batches have to be tested prior to release. This is our GMP requirement. GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practice, and it describes a set of principles and procedures that, when followed, help ensure that therapeutic goods are of high quality. Companies can't supply pharmaceutical products if they don't follow GMP practices. And the vaccines are not just tested by the manufacturers as part of GMP requirements. They are also retested by regulatory authorities all over the world. For instance, by the TGA in Australia, which results you can see here. And if they don't pass, the batch isn't used. And these are tests being done by people who are actually using approved procedures, not people who are making it up as they go along. Of course, there are some people who think that even the low amounts of DNA that are allowed by regulatory authorities are a problem because the DNA can enter cells. Although they don't explain why it isn't a problem when DNA enters cells from infection with DNA viruses or intracellular bacteria. It is really quite odd to be concerned about trace amounts of DNA entering cells, but not larger amounts entering. One of these odd people is Professor Philip Buchholz, 
who is especially odd because he turned up for an SC Senate hearing wearing a lab coat. Even odder, he keeps making all these provocative statements and then when they are amplified by anti-vaxxers and people get scared, he backtracks and says he didn't mean to scare anyone. He was just talking about possibilities that might not happen. So what's his possibility that might not happen? He thinks these trace amounts of DNA could integrate into the cell's nucleus. And he is basing this claim on this paper here, which was published in Scientific Reports. High spontaneous integration rates of N-modified linear DNAs upon mammalian cell transfection. Now, you may be wondering what this has to do with trace amounts of DNA fragments in vaccines. The answer is absolutely nothing. To start with, the experiments were done with various types of intact DNA not with fragments. Also, the concentration of DNA that was used in the experiments was 5,000 nanograms per milliliter, whereas the maximum amount allowed in the Moderna vaccine is only 20 nanograms per milliliter and only 33 nanograms per milliliter in the Pfizer vaccines. And the experiments were done in vitro, that is, in a lab and not a body. So there was no pesky immune system to worry about. Finally, the cell line used was HEC293T, which is a cell line that has been specifically designed to be highly transfectable and friendly to foreign DNA. It is also a rapidly dividing cell line, which further aids integration is a useful cell line for doing experiments like this, but it is very different than the cells present in the human body. So what happens when foreign DNA actually enters cells in the human body, which happens quite regularly? Well, the cells aren't happy. They hate having foreign nucleic acids from either DNA or RNA inside them. And they have a number of sensors that are able to distinguish between nucleic acids that belong in cells and foreign or altered nucleic acids. If foreign DNA is detected, it's marked for destruction. Firstly, enzymes in the cell will destroy DNA that is hanging around outside of the nucleus, which is where any DNA entering cells via nanoparticles will be. If that isn't enough to get rid of it all, the immune system kicks in and the cell is destroyed. Bye-bye foreign DNA. And this is going on in our bodies all the time because we are regularly infected with pathogens containing DNA. But wait, there's more. Anti-vaxxers are also claiming that the Pfizer vaccine, but not the Moderna vaccine, contains DNA from a virus known as SB40, which causes cancer. OMG! Only problem with this claim is that SB40 doesn't cause cancer in humans. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter because the Pfizer vaccine doesn't contain the SB40 virus. The DNA plasmid used in the manufacture of the Pfizer vaccine contains a sequence which is the same as a small section of the SB40 virus. This sequence is what is known as a promoter, and promoters encourage the creation of mRNA off the plasmid. And the SV promoter is one of many commonly used promoters. That's it. And its fate will be the same as the rest of the DNA in the plasmid. Most of it will be chopped up and removed as part of the manufacturing process. The trace amounts that remain will be destroyed in the body. So in summary, DNA in vaccines sounds scary if you don't understand the underlying science. But if you do, like little Cindy here does, you know it's no big deal. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I provide links in the video's description. And please remember this video is about the science 
but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everyone who has bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. We really appreciate your support. And finally, thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my channel. I still can't believe that I have managed to crack the 10,000 mark. I know it's still small compared to a lot of other channels and continually leads to comments by people who don't understand the appeal to popularity fallacy, but I'm rather chuffed. And if you haven't subscribed yet, it's not too late. Thank you.